Hello, everybody. Greetings from wherever you are joining us from. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all, and welcome to this FIP webinar that is um, focused on launching a FIP online course titled Digital Health and Pharmacy for Educators and Practitioners. It's a pleasure having you all. Welcome. We can see the numbers increasing as they enter in the room. I am delighted to be uh, co-moderating this webinar. My name is Dahlia Burgess at FIP. I am the lead for Provision and Partnerships Program. Delighted to also be joined by my colleague and co-moderator, Mr. Jaime Acosta from Spain. Jaime will go on camera to say hello to you in a moment. I can see him now. And Jaime um, is a community pharmacist in Spain. He plays a significant role over many years on different um, levels representing community pharmacy. He has a strong passion for the future of pharmacy and community pharmacy for all, from in Spain and around the world. But at FIP, Jaime is also the community pharmacy section professional secretary, but also is a co-lead of the FIP technology advisory group. Welcome, um, Jaime, and thank you for being the co-moderator for today's event. I am also supported today by um, my colleague, uh, Mr. Dr. Genuine uh, Disera from Kenya, a pharmacist registered in Kenya at FIP. He is an FIP member and volunteer in the Early Career Pharmaceutical Group. Welcome, Genuine, and thanks for the support. I'll run through some housekeeping announcements um, to uh, make you aware that the webinar, this FIP webinar is being recorded and live streamed via YouTube. The recording will be available on our website at um, events.fip.org. You may also ask questions using the question box provided at the bottom of your screen. You're also very welcome to provide feedback to our um, staff at webinars at FIP.org. We also would welcome you um, to consider becoming a member if you're not already a member of FIP and you can find out more about our membership and membership benefits at FIP.org forward slash membership underscore registrations. Welcome everybody. For those of you that are finding out about FIP or for the first time join an FIP webinar, I'd like to just share with you that the International Pharmaceutical Federation, FIP, was founded in 1912 in the Netherlands. FIP is the global federation that represents pharmacists, pharmaceutical scientists and um, educators from around the world. We are a federation of national associations representing millions of pharmacists, scientists, and educators from around the world, as I said. Our vision is a world is a world where everyone benefits from access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable medicines and pharmaceutical care. And our mission is to improve global health by supporting the advancement of pharmaceutical practice, science, and education. I would like to invite my co-moderator, uh, Mr. Jaime, to provide you with also further context about FIP and the one fit philosophy that drives this vision and mission that I described to you earlier. Welcome, Jaime. Thank you, Over Danny. You. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for being in this uh, webinar today. Uh, I know how busy we are, we all are always. So it's a, a, a pleasure to, to have you here with us uh, in the launch of this uh, course. So let me talk to you briefly about uh, one FIP, uh, which is uh, the vision that supports uh, this program and this webinar. Uh, and the, the maxim of one FIP, one FIP, the FIP have started to break down the silos and unify FIP with all structures working together. FIP is very powerful, and it's even more powerful ha ha uh, having everyone pushing in the same uh, direction under one FIP. In order to consolidate the position of pharmacists in the different health systems and to be able to take new roles and provide new services, all three domains of pharmacy, science, education, and practice are crucial. Practice cannot exist without science or education, 
And only this interdependency and the collaboration of these three domains can ensure universal health coverage. Let me also introduce you to the academic uh, pharmacy section in the next uh, slide where this project uh, started. The ACPS was founded in 1972, placed in the Board of Pharmaceutical Practice and FIP Education. The mission of the academic pharmacy section is to serve as an international source for networking, collaboration, and inspiration for educators to transform pharmacy education for the purpose of advancing uh, practice and science to meet present and future health needs in communities around the world. Also, uh, let me introduce you to the technology advisory group uh, that brings together experts uh, from within FIP membership to exchange views on current activities, problem areas, best practices, and more, all related to technology. It also serves as a, a very powerful networking platform for finding new contacts among fellow pharmacists and allows members to work together on joint projects that bring added value and are aligned with FIP's strategic plan. I am very much honored to um, co-chair the, uh, the group with my friend uh, Lars Oke Sudeland uh, from uh, Sweden. Uh, he's also an FIP vice president and has, and has served in different roles in the past as, for example, the community pharmacy section president. Current discussions in the FIP technology advisory group encompass various trends in digital health and education, um, use of technology in pharmacy, disruptors in pharmacy practice, for example, uh, the so-called Amazonification, uh, telepharmacy, telehealth, mobile health, etc. The group is co-delivering webinars dedicated to these topics, which are available to you in the FIP webpage. Please visit our FIP digital events page to access recordings of past webinars and stay tuned for future ones. Also, uh, let me talk to you about um, the uh, FIP academic institutional uh, membership, which was uh, which uh, currently has 168 pharmacy uh, pharmaceutical science uh, sciences schools from 56 uh, countries. In the uh, next slide, uh, I will hand over to my co-moderator Dalia to introduce you to uh, the speakers for this event. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jaime. Now uh, we have the exciting part of the webinar as well, which is to introduce our speakers who are going to lead a, a very enriching and inspiring uh, presentation here. I will introduce them um, as they appear on your slide. Um, our first um, presenter is Dr. Nako Arakawa, who is an assistant professor in international pharmacy at the University of Nottingham in the UK. Uh, Dr. Arakawa is also the Secretary of the Academic Pharmacy Section of the International Pharmaceutical Federation. She's also a global lead for competency development of the FIP hub or the FIP hub as well. Delighted to have you here. She's also been co-leading the development of this course with our colleague, Professor Akia Mantel who is a professor of pharmacy and global health at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Um, professor um, Akia is also a member of the executive team of the academic pharmacy um, section. Uh, also accompanied um, by Dr. Whitley Yi, who is a pharmacy specialist and member services delivery manager, also an adjunct lecturer at the University of Colorado Skaggs School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences in the United States. We also have Dr. Mohammed Baraka, who is an Associate Professor of Clinical Pharmacy at Al Ain University in the United Arab um, of Emirates. We are also joined today by Professor Barry Blight, Professor at the Barry and Judy Silverman College of Pharmacy at Nova Southern Eastern University in the United States. We also have Dr. Natasha Jovanovic, who is the Dean Faculty of Pharmacy at the Faculty of Pharmacy in Novi Sad in Serbia. All of our colleagues on this presentation, as well as the, the, the colleagues that have supported the development of this uh, um, program and will be acknowledged later are all members 
of the program design and assessment working group that stems from the academic pharmacy section at FIP. Welcome, dear colleagues. We're excited to have you all, and we can now proceed to our first presentation. However, before I do that, can I please also welcome our um, Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Catherine Duggan, who is joining us today um, for the panel discussion that will be conducted a bit later uh, after the, our, our speakers do their, do their presentations. Welcome to the call, Dr. Duggan. Now I'd like to just provide you with an overview of the program outline. We have done the introduction for you, but we will move on to uh, providing an, in the importance of digital health and pharmacy, a brief history of course development uh, that would be provided by, by our colleague, Dr. Arakawa. We will then move on to the importance of integration of digital health topics in pharmacy education that will be covered by Dr. Whitley. We will then get some feedback from previous participants in the course um, that participated in the last year's course from Dr. Muhammad. We will then receive some updates. What makes this course different from last year's one uh, from each of the module teams, module one, module two, and module three. We will then have the pleasure of relaunching the, the, the online course from FYP. We will then move on to a panel discussion and our CEO will join in uh, afterwards for final reflections and I will conclude the presentation. Now I can move on to our first presenter. Dr. Nako Arakawa, the floor is yours. Welcome, Nako. Thank you, Daria, for the introduction and welcome everybody to this webinar. Uh, thank you for coming to this webinar and launch of the course so that you, know, you can enjoy learning afterwards. Hi, right, so next page, please. Thank you. So the journey for this program actually started from this FIP Digital Health and Pharmacy Education Report, which is published in January 2021. So if you haven't read it yet, you can download this report from the link in the slide for free. So please do so if you haven't. So this report included the result from the global survey on digital health in pharmacy education, which uh, had the response uh, from 91 countries. Based on such results, this report describes the readiness adaptability and responsiveness of pharmacy education and knowledge and the skill needs of pharmaceutical workforce on digital health. And this report outlined uh, education initiatives on digital health and from pharmacy schools around the world. So if you want to see some detailed case studies um, that the um, that report has the numerous uh, case studies there too. This report became an evidence base to integrate digital health subjects into pharmacy education and to equip the pharmaceutical workforce with necessary digital health knowledge and the skills. So next slide, please. So based on the evidence provided in the previous slide and report, that report identified what is needed for future. And that these are these four things um, identified including the capitalizing on benefit of digital health and digital health education and the training for the pharmaceutical workforce, interest for integrating digital health into pharmacy educational practice and developing the digitally enabled pharmaceutical workforce and the FYP global curriculum and the training resources for digital health education. This fourth recommendation was well captured in, in the global survey, which I'm going to show you in the next slide. Next slide, please. So this global survey report in the, um, in the report actually identified that 60% of the respondents globally reported no component or course related digital health in pharmacy education although the importance of it is well documented in the report and it also will be presented by um, Dr. Whitney Lee later. And the majority of respondents actually also identify that lack of experts to facilitate learning experiences and resources as challenges um, to provide the education related to digital health. So next slide, please. Therefore, the FIP academic pharmacy section collaborates with wider FIP constituencies under the one fit strategy, 
we developed the FYP online course to support members to not only integrate digital health topics in pharmacy education, but also support the development along with the maturation process, which is uh, provided by Dr. Ang and his colleagues in this journal. And there are also case studies and the um, reports are uh, identified in the uh, global, um, sorry, the uh, digital health and pharmacy education report. So that you know, we can provide varying, uh, varying benefits based on the different needs of the members. Next slide, please. So we launched the first FIP online course on digital health and pharmacy education in January 2022, so last year. This program targeted mainly on academics and educators who are FIP members. And we also welcomed the, um, many other FIP member pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists from other pharmacy sectors to observe first the module to update their knowledge of digital health as their continuing professional development. The program objectives were set as expand their teaching capacity in the field of digital health and to become a change maker in supporting the integration of digital health in pharmacy education and eventually assist future pharmacy, uh, pharmacy practitioners delivering digital health in practice. So if you're interested, you can watch the webinar um, when we launched last year from the web link provided in the slide too. Next slide, please. So considering the fast changing and advancing subject, we actually closed the first course at the end of October 22, uh, 2022 to review and update the program. As of the end of October last year, that is when we closed the first course, we had 27 members completed the course successfully and awarded the certificate of completion. Today, we are happy to inform you all that you know, we um, had completed the review and the updates of the course. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Whitney Yi to further discuss why digital health topics you know, should be integrated in pharmacy education, which I am sure you will be motivated to enroll yourself for the program. So next slide, please. And Dr. Whitney um, Yi, as uh, introduced by also Dr. Dario Vazis, and um, Whitney, who is yours now? Thank you so much, Naoko. Um, I'm honored to be here. So when we think of digital health, it is a very you know, vast topic, but ultimately we can think of digital health as any technology or process that is attempting to change how healthcare is being accessed, delivered, and consumed. And so we have seen a vast acceleration of digital health tools, especially post-COVID. And these applications have ranged from anything from telemedicine to diagnostics and imaging to patient health apps to enhanced access to medication knowledge and enhanced decision support. And so digital health transformation has brought about many benefits for both patients and healthcare providers. Some of those include improved accessibility and improved health outcomes. It's one of the key benefits has been enhancing the accessibility and convenience that digital health can offer to patients. By having access through patient portals and telemedicine, patients can connect with healthcare professionals remotely, which can help increase those that are able to access it and eliminate the need for travel or reducing wait times. And so this is especially beneficial for those in remote areas, but also those with limited mobility or those that need more frequent access. And again, digital health has also been empowering providers with data-driven insights and predictive analytics to help improve patient outcomes. And so we know that when we utilize and leverage digital health technology to its fullest, we can help reduce medication errors and we can leverage information in electronic records and analyze patient data to make better informed decisions and provide more personalized treatment plans. And this can help with avoiding adverse drug reactions or identifying potential risk and improving overall patient safety. So overall, we know there are many benefits to digital health, um, to the leveraging digital health in the healthcare system, but it's also had a profound impacts just on the entire landscape overall and changing what the typical consumer looks like, creating an empowered consumer. 
if we think about, so not only is the healthcare landscape changing and we have patients that are more empowered who are looking for more continuous preventative care. We also have seen a profound shift in just the concept of therapeutics in general. So no longer do we think of medicine just as a chemical or biological substance. It's now also a digital substance. We have, we can use software and AI devices or AI enabled devices and wearables as therapeutics themselves. And so expanding the realm of treatment from just general medication treatment to now thinking about digital treatment as well, almost anything in a patient's environment or lifestyle could be considered an intervention and something that we then have the possibility to shape to improve outcomes. Some examples that we've that we've seen positive benefits with is just using apps, for instance, using cognitive behavioral hair therapy to help improve sleep. That's shown that it can actually be more beneficial than sleep than um, sleep aids or medication. Utilizing virtual and augmented reality for pain control, also helping use utilizing a combination of both medication and digital devices to help improve um, to help improve migraines or to even help improve quitting smoking, for instance. And so we're moving now into the realm of algorithm d- driven decision making where we have to understand these different devices and these different technologies and how they interact with each other, but also with with medications. Next slide, please. There's a lot of analogies we can draw to some other industries in terms of how we need to think about the workforce shifting, right? If we think about the automobile industry, for instance, we saw a major shift in the skills that were needed if you wanted to um, utilize transportation from when we had horse-drawn carriages or buggies to then moving to the first automobile. We now had something that was automated. It required completely different skills. It required knowing different the rules of the road and understanding safety in a different mechanism. And so this kind of represents the shift that we saw from think about just the initial digitization, right? Where we just, where we had everything maybe in paper form and then we transformed it into a digital format, right? But we were still utilizing it similarly. So we still have patient records, but now we just had electronic records. Still the same records, but just in a digital format. Now we're moving to the next shift. Right. So if we think about the first automobiles, we didn't have any information that told us what, where we were going, nothing that improved, that told us navigation, nothing that told us around the, the actual maintenance status of the vehicle. You didn't really know when the car could break down, when you needed to perform um, any routine maintenance on it, or when you may need to fill it up with gas, you're kind of driving blind. And that was similar to how we had been with a lot of our, with just the digital, digitization of information is when we don't have anything connected and we're not utilizing an intelligence layer on top of the data we have access to, we're still in a way flying by blind, even though we have all this data. And so now we're moving into an area or into an era where we're building additional intelligence on top of this, creating internet of things and creating networks and ecosystems where these different tools can speak and talk to each other. And now we have the ability to have a greater influence on both patients' health, but also understand how we, how we as clinicians can really impact a patient's health. And this is going to require new skills because there's different data available to us. And this data means that we have to understand how we make clinical decisions differently. Next slide. We think about the future healthcare workforce. There have been several key sectors that are believed to have some of the biggest disruption, including telemedicine and smartphone apps and looking at genomics as well as artificial intelligence. And ultimately, we have to have a workforce that's not only familiar with these tools, but it's more so familiar with the underlying concepts of how to use them right, the number of technology tools is going to continue to expand exponentially. 
but it's more so important that we understand how we prepare a workforce that is technologically literate. And so having a digitally enabled pharmaceutical workforce, they must be skillfully able to leverage digital tools. If we're going to use them to their full capacity, then we have to know how to use them. And these tools are ranging from anything from understanding virtual care and remote care, understanding consumer technology or mobile health apps. We have sensors and wearables and ingestibles. Digital biomarkers are going to be a game changer in terms of what kind of both patient-aided decisions can be made, as well as clinician-aided decision-making. And then artificial intelligence and machine learning is driving a lot, as well as genomics and AI-enabled diagnostics. And then our natural language tools, which you've seen a lot coming out in recent news, like with ChatGPT, for instance, these are all different tools that are both disrupting how we deliver care, but also how we need to think about providing care and making these care decisions, including how do we, how, do, how should clinicians understand both the capacity of these different tools, what their functionality is, what their risks are, and what their potential limitations are. Next slide. And so with this, we have to build a, we have to build a workforce that understands how to apply data and is technologically literate. If we look at some of the results of the FIP Digital Health Pharmacy Education Report, for example, which is listed here, we've seen that up to 70, over 70% of practitioners who check the report said that they use some type of healthcare technology in their everyday practice. However, only 25% of them said that they received any type of digital education around how to use those in their formal education or continuous education. And so there is a huge deficit and gap there around what education pharmacy students have received and how they're then utilizing those tools in practice. And so on the graph here on the right, this shows the percentage of practitioners that are actually using different tools. And so you see with some of the, with some of the tools, see prescribing or mobile applications, there is relatively, um, there's relatively high use among them. But as we start getting into some of the other emerging technologies, the utilization drops significantly. And it's important that we have a workforce that understands how to leverage these emerging technologies to make sure that we're employing them to their fullest to improve patient health outcomes. And we look at what needs and gaps there were that were reported by practitioners one of the greatest needs was helping understand what is the appropriate skill set and knowledge for how to apply technology to existing clinical problems to improve care. It's not just an understanding of what exists, but how do we actually leverage it? What does, how can this, these existing tools be used in my everyday practice to actually improve patient care? And then practitioners also expressed a greater need for, su for support including access to digital health tools and greater education and knowledge on how to apply them in practice. Next slide. With this, again, becomes and the importance of teaching those new skills that we've talked about, which is going to be primarily a huge area for data literacy. And we need to understand you know, how do we prepare clinicians for the fact that healthcare provision is going to be changing very significantly. It's going to continue to change. And this, um, this chart down here on the bottom right, this shows an example of what kind of data clinicians currently have access to. So if we go into our traditional healthcare model where patients come in and receive, you know, episodic treatment, then we have like small snapshots into their life and into their health status. But underneath that is the invisible data that you, we may not see, which is where their health status is actually changing significantly in between each one of those snapshots. And what happens right now is that we have a lot of guidelines and um, current best practices are all based on making decisions based on those 
seeing, you know, those very intermittent snapshots of data of a patient status. But more and more, we're gaining access to that invisible data. What does a patient's continuous health status look like? What is their health in their home and in their environment, not just in the health system? And with this kind of data, you have to be able to understand how to interpret it. How do you make clinical decisions based off that, even if there is not necessarily the, the guidelines or the current tools that we need available to make those decisions? It's the ability to understand how to apply this raw data and how to help patients understand it. We're moving into the realm of the informed consumer where patients are going to have more data on themselves than we do. And how do we educate them on how to also make their own decisions and how to understand how to interpret what they're seeing and guide them as well as when to come and seek support or um, seek care based on this information. And we, and, the, and again, in addition to this is also navigating digital determinants of health. We're going to see significant differences in potential equity based on what access patients have to digital tools and how do we manage this as clinicians. And lastly, critical appraisal and interpretation of AI technology. Just like we have focused on evidence-based medicine and how to understand that and apply studies and understand if those apply to the patient in front of us, how do we do the same thing with AI? If a patient comes to you because they have talked to chat GPT or a large language model and it's given them a recommendation for their health, how do you then navigate that with a patient and understand where those systems can go wrong and informing patients when they can and can't trust those, those systems. See, these are all important concepts that it is critical that our workforce going into the future knows how to navigate this. And this is a new set of skills that we need to build in from the very beginning. Education is the core of preparing our workforce. And these, these are not standalone concepts. These are things that we can integrate throughout every area of the curriculum. Next slide. So lastly, this is just iterating again, the importance of the FIPs, Digital Health um, Sustainable Development Goal. We need to incorporate digital health into the curricula because we need to be able to have pharmacy students that can leverage existing and future tools to support patient care. And this can allow pharmacists to develop and apply and practice to the full set of their, to the full level and extent of their education. And it's critical that these components be included in all levels in formal and informal education and the curricula so that we can help train our healthcare professionals and train our pharmacists of the future to be able to leverage this to the fullest. And so with this, I think it's important again that we just think about how do we create those enablers of digital transformation. And again, our educators are going to be our key change makers in making sure that this happens. And so I wanna thank you so much for this opportunity to talk a little bit about digital transformation. And now I would like to turn it over to Mohammed, who's gonna go through some feedback around the course. Thank you. Thanks so much, Whitley. Uh, yes, indeed, education is the core for changing and for preparing our uh, future healthcare providers for this rapidly evolving field. And to do this, and as an academician, I found myself having a high responsibility to engage in such courses and to learn more about digital health in order to prepare my students to be future ready. So I joined the course. And um, uh, next sli slide, please, Genwin. Um, uh, I was lucky to join uh, the FIP in 2021 because I knew that they are uh, 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 producing a, a really great course about digital health in 2022. And uh, uh, it was great to have uh, such experience. And I'm delighted to share with you my experience regarding this course. The course has provided me with uh, uh, a great amount of foundational uh, 
materials regarding the technologies and its integration in our daily routine as practitioners and also as educators. So regarding the course comprehensiveness, uh, we learned a lot about the digital health trends, even from the uh, business point of view, the digital therapeutics and what makes a digital health a digital therapeutics because they are different, they're totally different. Uh, we learned a lot about the wearables and sensors, how to use mobile health in addition to wearables and sensors for remote patient monitoring and for follow up with your patients in order to not uh, miss any of the patient's uh, important milestones. Uh, in addition to this, the course included uh, uh, some uh, topics about e-prescribing, e-dispensing and telepharmacy as well as well. And this helped us to start a, a, some piloting for uh, telepharmacy implementation in our school and to uh, develop a, a, a whole new course for digital health in our and integrate it in our curriculum. Um, of course, uh, because uh, with the integration of digital health and, and this is new for everyone, you should expect with this implementation to have some challenges. And this was a core part also in that course. So what intrigued me in this course was the, in addition to the comprehensiveness, was the quality and up-to-date materials that have been uh, uh, developed by, uh, by the educators of this course, in addition to uh, uh, improving our awareness regarding how to integrate it in, the, in your curriculum as, as educators. And this is very important for change making, uh, making and for preparing our future graduates for the uh, uh, future healthcare market. Uh, in addition to this, the use cases that have been uh, uh, added from different uh, different countries and the experiences that were really inspiring uh, from our uh, our colleagues who started implementation of digital health tools and the implementation of the development of the uh, digital health courses in their curricula. Um, uh, moreover, uh, I was really uh, happy with the amazing, amazing uh, peer review uh, experience that we had with when when we uh, uh, started to draft our plans, short term and long term plans, as one of the exercises we had in this course, and receiving feedback from our colleagues and giving feedback to other colleagues on their plans. We learned a lot from these experiences, and uh, I believe this will be also helpful for educators who are willing to integrate and implement such uh, educational experiences for their uh, students. Uh, what was really amazing is the support we received and the quick feedback we received from the educators of the course. Uh, uh, it's, it's really, really important to have such support and reminders from time to time, especially for people who are uh, very busy, like educators and practitioners. <clears throat> and this was uh, uh, really, really amazing. So uh, uh, overall, the course was really comprehensive, high quality, uh, uh, included so many and diverse topics uh, about digital health and empowered us to uh, uh, do our role as educators to uh, train our students and to develop uh, their awareness regarding digital health in addition to the uh, uh, development of courses and the integration of these educational experiences in the, in the curriculum. So uh, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, give my testimonial about the course. And now uh, I hand it over to my colleague, uh, Naoko. Naoko, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mohammad. Say, Jenin, could you? Yes, thank you very much. Say, great and pleasure to have, uh, you know, the feedback and the, the testimonials you know, from the last year's uh, program, but also great future already uh, put now after this program in the education. That is great you know, benefit and the impact you know, from the program we created last year. But from these feedbacks, not only uh, from uh, Professor Baraka, but also you know, we had uh, so many different feedback you know, and also the comments you know, from the other courts, but also the you know, experts you know, uh, to the program. So we listened um, to the feedback and then we changed and you know, updated you know, uh, uh, with the review of the contents as well. So next slide, please. So 
the having the three modules were not changed, but the module one is the uh, greatly updated, um, separated into four sections, including the uh, other readings and resources um, section as a fourth, and then the greatly updated um, by the, all the experts in the, in the field, so that the 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 many of the materials the, are ready to be used. Uh, for many pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists and, and educators. And in module two, um, we have new case studies you know, from uh, Professor Baraka, so that you know, we can see the um, great you know, new case study added, but also we rearrange the assessment and you know, the feedback um, process so that you now you can see easily see the all the peer feedbacks you know, and get the peer feedbacks you know, after that assessment so that you, know, you can share and the learn uh, from the others uh, learning. And module three, uh, peer review activities you now are updated you know, with the renewed contents so that you know, all contents are reviewed you know, as the updated for mod three modules accordingly. So two clicks, um, please add it to it. So thank you very much. So the, for the last program, we only certified the certificate of completion after the completion of module three. But considering that or the, you know, having witnessed that so many actually finished the module one as a professional development you know, from different sectors, we decided to award the completion of uh, certificate and completion after the module one as well. So once you finish the module one, you will uh, uh, you will be awarded with a certificate and completion. And also um, that is the requirement to move to the module two and the module three to get the um, full certificate and of completion of this course. And then now from um, we will get the more detailed and update presentation from each module and acknowledge the order uh, developers you know, of the course. Thank you very much you know, all for the contribution. And then now I, I would like to introduce two presenters you know, for module one team. So one uh, first, uh, Muhammad, uh, Associate and Professor of Clinical Pharmacy, Muhammad Balaka. Um, from Al Ain University, Abdobi, UAE, and also Professor Natasha uh, Juskovic, sorry the, for my pronunciation, uh, Dean and Professor at the Faculty of Pharmacy in Novsa, Selvia. So I'm going to give you, uh, Natasha, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Naoko. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this event. Thank you for your time, because time is uh, an asset, uh, very important in 21st century, the same as digital health and digital pharmacy. Um, uh, that's an important topic that we are dealing today um, and that we are presenting today as well. Well, uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a, not a work of one, two persons. This is a work of, of the team because success is the best when it's shared, uh, said uh, Howard Schultz uh, once. And I really uh, want to give a credit to my teammates, my colleagues, besides uh, Mohammed and me. We have uh, Michael Katz with Lee, Tora Hamar, Ehemia Costa Gomez. Uh, all of them, all of us contributed uh, equally, um, made an, a significant effort to uh, create an update of, of uh, module one. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as you could have heard uh, from my colleagues, um, the first version of the course was launched in January 2000, uh, in January 2022. And uh, we had the opportunity to have a participant enrolled uh, to get their feedbacks. We got one feedback today from uh, Mohammed, but also from many others. Uh, so we uh, reviewed the feedback, we learned uh, about their experiences. Uh, also, digital health self is a topic and field that is uh, fast growing, fast changing. So it uh, requires constantly uh, following of this area and updating with the, with the new, new uh, developments, new innovation. 
So uh, gathering all that together, uh, we decided to uh, create an update of this uh, course. Um, and as now mentioned, uh, we still have three modules. Um, my team, we work on the module on update of module one. Module one contained, uh, I think, a, a lot of information. It still contains a lot of information because it gives an introduction, uh, introduction to digital health. Uh, so we reviewed carefully what we want to do with the information we had and with the new information. Uh, we started with the learning objectives because we still wanted to give um, uh, some basic knowledge on digital health. So we divided, defined uh, three main uh, learning objectives. And that's, that these are understanding the trends and the role of digital health technology in healthcare pharmacy practice then uh, that people are familiar with the latest digital health tools and the application in patient care. And of course, very relevant is to develop of, uh, an, an understanding of challenges in digital health, because we can talk about different tools, about different uh, application benefits, but it, at the same time, you have to be aware of various challenges related to, to this uh, issue. Next slide. Uh, so what, what, what we also wanted to do is to make uh, a learning process easier to our participant. Uh, so we divided module one uh, in several sections. Actually, we have three main sections. Uh, the first one is introduction to digital health. Then uh, we will, in section two, we will present digital health tools for pharmacists. And in section three, uh, we are dealing with the challenges with digital health. Um, as I mentioned, we had a lot of information, a lot of uh, publication sources, so we, um, this, uh, we uh, selected the most relevant ones that we put as an uh, obligatory reading in section one, two, three, some additional readings, and the rest that we found as very important, um, uh, very um, uh, contributing to, to the knowledge in this field, we put in section four for, uh, for everyone who is interested to read more and to broad uh, his or her expertise, ex expertise in, in uh, this area. So uh, we, uh, we hope that with this structure, we will make a, a study process easier uh, for all participants. And because this is uh, a module that gives an overview and introduction to a digital health, it can also be a standalone course. And what I would like also to mention that uh, we also created some multiple choice questions just for you to check your knowledge uh, so that you uh, uh, as a participants are, are having um, an idea how, how well you are doing with, with, the, with, with the course uh, content. Uh, by saying this, uh, I will give a, um, a floor award to my colleague Mohamed, who will uh, introduce a bit more in detail the sections of the module one. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Natasha. And because this is a very important uh, module and because this can be a standalone course for you, and in order to achieve the obje objectives of this module, uh, as Natasha said, we have divided it into uh, four sections. The first section is about is introductory to digital health. And uh, in order to achieve the objective of understanding the trends and roles of digital health technologies, we included some materials that are really foundational. Next slide, please. So here, our objective was to uh, help the learner to gain a broad pers perspective about the digital health tools and the different key technologies that can be expected to be part of your daily routine about the current and future impact of digital health on transforming the healthcare system, the clinicians, patients, and the dynamic interaction between the clinicians and patients, and how digital health is being planned and implemented globally. Next slide, please. So section one was introductory, section two was really delving deeper into the digital tools that can be used and implemented. And here we uh, were having the objective of familiarizing the learners with the latest digital health tools because they are not only one or two, there are the digital health is a big umbrella that includes so many tools under it. And here we are 
uh, 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 willing to help you understand the different tools and the differences between these tools and how to use them. Next slide, please. So uh, for section two, we, uh, we were keen to include uh, the different tools like the health information systems, the uh, health information management and the exchange between the different databases, the virtual care, de care delivery platforms. And uh, the, uh, we can see nowadays the expansion in telehealth and, uh, and the telepharmacy. Uh, what is telepharmacy? How can you use it as a pharmacist in, in dealing with your patients and in providing remote care? The mHealth applications and the remote patient monitoring tools that we use nowadays with the recent advances in sensors and wearables, especially with artificial intelligence being part of this and the rapid evolving of such tools. So you can definitely find topics talking about these things and how can you use it for remote patient monitoring clinical decision support, of course, systems are very important for uh, the daily routine of the pharmacists and healthcare professionals. And to this artificial intelligence that got expanded this, uh, this year, especially after introduction of chat GPT and uh, uh, the digital therapeutics. Not every health app can be a digital therapeutic. Digital therapeutics needs to be approved, needs to be regulated. We need to ensure its safety and efficacy before in integrating them and selecting them for use with our patients. So you will find a, a, a specific part for digital therapeutics and how can they be used for managing, preventing and treating certain diseases. Next slide, please. And now we come to section three, which is concerning with the challenges with digital health. We know that because uh, digital health is a, is a relatively new uh, 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 subject and the digital health tools are uh, relatively new to be integrated in our uh, daily routine. So uh, we need here in this section to help you develop understanding of the challenges around digital health. And there are many. So next slide, please. So here in the section, you are expected to learn about the patient safety. As we said, they should be safe, they should be efficacious. Information safety, uh, interoperability, because we wanted to, show, to, to ensure that these systems can interact with each other and can talk to each other. Ethics and governance is a big concern nowadays. The need for multidisciplinary collaboration and the mutual understanding between the different healthcare providers and how they all can perceive such tools. The social aspect of implementation, the uh, ethical considerations that are coming with the implementation. And one very important thing is the need for competence and education. And this is one of the objectives of developing such course for educators in addition to all these challenges that will face uh, practitioners. Next slide, please. So with this, I will hand it over to my colleague, Prof. Uh, Okia, to enlighten us about module two. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Baraka. I'm uh, very happy to provide an update of module two, and I believe that in the next slide, you will see the colleagues who participated in this module, my colleague, Dr. Naoka Arakawa, um, Ms. Nilhan Usman, um, who uh, was especially involved in the early setup of this uh, module. Um, and more recently, we were joined by our colleague, Tora Hamar, who is also in the call uh, today. Um, so module two is actually the module um, that um, starts with a focus on education and how you can incorporate some of the things that we've been talking about today um, into your education to students. And um, as part of this module, uh, people were um, presented or are presented with a number of case studies from different areas all over the world, but also from, let's say, different um, uh, uh, ways where people um, uh, uh, integrate their courses. So some of us are in the stage where we want to start, where nothing is in the curriculum and you want to get a good start. Some may have already something in the curriculum and they want to, for example, develop or incorporate a whole course. And then there's also um, curricula who are already at the stage that they want to 
um, address um, this issue throughout their whole curriculum. So there's different stages in this module and for each stage we have two case studies and we are very happy that uh, one of the case studies that was let's say a paper-based case study only is now also replaced by a case study presented by one of the colleagues uh, in this case already mentioned Dr. Baraka who uh, shares his experience on, on telemedicines from the United Arab uh, Emirates. Um, so um, when you take this module, you are not expected to watch all cases. We recommend people to watch at least two that are most close to the stage that they are in, in their own curriculum. But if you find the time, um, you can, of course, uh, uh, look at all of them and, and you may get new ideas, for example. But the, the, the baseline is that we recommend to look at least at two. And then there's an assignment and that assignment was updated um, uh, based on the review and, and, and the feedback also from previous participants, especially to clarify what the expected level of detail is, because this is an assignment where you think for your own situation, your own school, your own program, how you can start to introduce or update maybe um, digital health education. And um, well, um, I think that people uh, gave us as feedback that it took them quite a bit of time because they went into a lot of detail, whereas um, uh, to stay within the anticipated time for this module, we see this as, as a, a more of a quick first entry into this um, to, to get you thinking and start uh, exploring what would work, what would be needed, et cetera. So we have tried to clarify that. Um, in the uh, assignment itself. And the final small change, uh, but important change, I believe that uh, we made that was also already announced by Naoko, is that um, uh, part of this assignment is that you provide feedback and receive feedback on the assignment by colleagues who also participate in the course. But previously, you could not move to module three before this was all completed. And now, while you may still be uh, awaiting for feedback on your own assignment, you can already move to module three. So you are, not, let's say, uphold to uh, to move on with the course. I think these are the most important changes to module two, the most important updates. And now I would like to hand over to my colleagues, Natasha and, oh, I'm not sure. I think it's Natasha for module three. Sorry. No, it's Good Barry. 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 Sorry, it's sorry, okay. Barry. <laughs> it's we have so me. many people involved here. I'm happy that you are yes. presenting now on the well, module three. I'm glad to see everybody. It's welcome to everyone. I'm speaking to you from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the updates we did in module three. Um, if you'll move to the next slide, uh, you never work in a vacuum. I worked with two wonderful colleagues, uh, Manzi Doshi uh, from the from India and from Professor Lillian as a party from Malta. And uh, we spent a lot of time together working on these projects and we're uh, real excited about some of our updates. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as part of creating a digital health curriculum, this was very important for us to talk about that digital health and the digital technology includes more than just the computer skills, the technology skills. Uh, literacy includes uh, protecting private information, having effective searching capabilities, being able to attribute proper credit to sources. And this has become more important with uh, some of our newer generation Gen Z students, which uh, you can learn about uh, uh, grasping your digital footprint. What have you left behind? And then of course, respect and courtesy. Um, uh, net, netiquette and these kind of things are very important. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so um, on our updates, we're, um, our activity has been moved from a graded one to more of a pass-fail because it's meant to be um, what you're trying to do. You kind of select from recording a practice teaching session or, to, or developing some kind of training tool or structured approach for how you had planned in your institution to institute uh, or to integrate digital health into your curriculum. So we just want to just look at that. And uh, so there's no, you know, there, it's really that. And then most importantly, I'll talk about the, the, the module talks a little bit about the human touch. It's really important because our patients have already health anxieties from their health. 
They have um, health literacy uh, issues possibly, and they may have technological issues. So we stress throughout our module that this is a human touch. And we want to make sure that people uh, remember and respect their, their patients in, in, in that way. Uh, and, and I think it'll make that. And I will now turn it back to Genuine. Um, thanks, Barry. Uh, so my name is Jenner Desire, and I have been working as an uh, ECPG intern under the Provisions and Partnerships Program. And I was involved in the development of parts of the, the course, particularly ensuring that it's well hosted on, on, our, on the FIP learning management system and that it's updated as stated. Um, I also provide technical user support to all, all the feedbacks users. And this involves ensuring that your use of the platform is, is hiccup free. I am delighted to be part of this team and I'm proud of the improvements that we continue to make to the course. I certainly hope that um, all of us will benefit from, from it greatly. Now, uh, please note that the course is a member benefit and as such it will only be available for FIP members. And therefore we, we encourage all those who aren't FIP members yet to register today. You can scan the QR code that has been shared on your screens, or you can go to the link uh, just below it to register. Um, the, the, the online course was created and is hosted on the on FIP's online learning and professional development system. We call it FIPEX, and it's a separate platform from the, the FIP website. We have designed it to meet your needs and the demands of uh, online course developers and participants. Now to the exciting part, uh, joining the course is as simple as one, two, three. First, you will need to go to the link that is shared there. You can also scan uh, the QR code that is beside it to quickly go to the, to the link. Um, you can then register your interest to be enrolled on the registration page where you'll be required to input your contact information. Once this is done, you will receive a confirmation email from us and your login details will be sent to you in three to four working days. Um, remember that the email will prompt you to change your password when you log in for the first time. So kindly ensure that, that you do this. Um, as stated earlier, uh, this remains a member benefit. And if you're a member of FIP, you can register for the course beginning today. Um, this link will also be shared in the chat box and the, the link will also be embedded in all our promotional material. Welcome, and we look forward to, to you learning more. I'd like to hand it over back to Dahlia Badges. Thank you so much, um, Genuine, and a big thank you from all of us to our esteemed colleagues for these enlightening presentations. It's super exciting to have seen the, the, the course improvements and further developments from last year, and we're super proud um, to, to launch it today for all of our colleagues from around the world. And it's as simple as becoming a member of FIP. So you can actually avail of a variety of other member benefits that will benefit your professional development, but also your career growth, your networking opportunities, your collaborative opportunities, project-based involvement, um, and meeting and participating in events such as these, sharing your expertise and experience. So we are really really encouraging you to become a member of FIP so you can avail and support yourself and others around you and within your networks to really advance pharmacy worldwide to really join us in the family of FIP to advance pharmacy worldwide so we are not leaving anyone behind we encourage you to become a member so you can avail or you know to to access this particular course for free but also to provide you with an opportunity to avail of the other benefits that FIP provides to you, your institutions, your colleagues, your peers, and even your students. 
So welcome to those that are considering to join FIP today to access this course and also to benefit from other resources that this federation provides to us. It gives me great pleasure at this point in time just to mention that this program or this course, whilst it was driven by the academic pharmacy section, by the technology advisory group and members with, within the fam FIP family from the community and hospital pharmacy sections, it really was supported by the provision and partnerships program at FIP. At FIP, we envision providing a platform for our members where they can engage, they develop, to support each other, to address some of the training and development needs that might exist, that, might, that they might be aware of, or that FIP might know about from its data and intelligence um, activities. And so this platform is able to do that in a variety of ways or in a variety of models, if you like. One way of doing it is by FIP providing um, courses such as this one that has been developed by members for or to its members. So this is an FIP developed course because it was based on um, findings from earlier reports that were developed by FIP and from our membership needs and priorities that were identified in the area of digital health. And then our esteemed colleagues, experts in the field have taken on this journey to develop such a course to address those learning needs to support the development of the workforce around the world. And so this is one way of doing it, but I also would like to mention to our colleagues on the call today, and those of you that might be interested in continuing professional development or are providers of CPD uh, uh, programs or courses, that we also have the FIP SEAL program. And the FIP SEAL is a visible stamp, uh, uh, sign of, of quality, but also of alignment with FIP's uh, vision to advance pharmacy worldwide and also in alignment with our development goals. And to find out more about this, these uh, programs, these drivers that I'm mentioning to you, please do visit our website to learn more about it. If you want to know more about the FIP SEAL and how it can support the progress of our profession across practice, science and education, please do visit our website under um, for, at FIP.org under programs of work. Welcome everyone, and it gives me now great pleasure to move forward, um, genuine, with the, our presentation. And now, uh, uh, Jaime and I would like to welcome all of our presenters to a panel discussion. We have, you know, good amount of time now to address some of the very important questions that have come through the Q and A box, but also through the chat, uh, and, and also through some of the discussions, uh, side discussions on the chat as well, with the panelists. So I invite all of our esteemed colleagues to come on camera. We will stop sharing screen for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes or so, actually, Jaime, we can do 20 minutes. And um, really just reflect on the amazing presentation and this great work, colleagues, that you have led. We're super proud of it. Um, and address some of the burning questions that have come through. Jaime is going to support me tremendously in leading this segment. And Jaime, we have a number of questions that have come through about how do we enroll in the course? How much is this going to cost us? How do we go about this? Genuine has already covered it. So we can just continue to remind our colleagues on the call and the listeners afterwards that this is a member only uh, course. We encourage you to become a member of FIP so you can access the course to, to improve in this particular area. Um, back, so I'll go to you, Jaime, now, and I'm happy to support you. There's a few questions there in the chat box and the Q&A box as well. If you'd like, we can go through them one by one. Sure. As is, thanks a million, Jaime. Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll start with the first one, actually, from Bertrand uh, Korkut. Thank you for your question. Uh, I think, uh, well, this uh, can be answered by anyone in the call, but uh, I would like to uh, direct it first to, to Whitley. Uh, the question is, uh, which skills do we pharmacists need to improve individually to be able to utilize these digital technologies? So with it, please, if you can answer the question and then we can go over to any other colleagues in the call. Fantastic. <clears throat> Thanks, Jaime. Uh, I think this is, I think this is a very yeah, important question around like what, what skills do we need? And I think the most important skill to start off is really a understanding of literacy, literacy around technology and, and data, um, because this will underpin, underpin everything else. 
And so as different technologies evolve, the way that they're going to be applied is going to look different, but ultimately being able to understand how these tools can be used and what we do with the data that they produce is going to be what's so important. Data is really the new currency of information going forward. And so understanding how it's generated, whether we can trust the way it's generated or not, and even the way it's generated, how well, how we can use that, what interpretations or assumptions we can make from that, and what the limitations and risks are, are going to be key. And then I think also being able to it's being able to keep up with technology. And so like uh, being a continuous lifetime learner and being able to understand what questions to ask and where to go for different information. I mean, we do not always, especially with new technologies, we do not always have the vetted resources that we do for drug information, for instance. And so being able to understand how to assess the literature and know what trusted resources are and how do we that and critically appraise these technologies is going to be um, really important going forward. And that's just, you know, hi briefly highlighting, I think, some of the top skills, but I'd love to hand it over to any of my other colleagues that would like to elaborate more on some of the important skills. Yeah, I'd just like to mention, too, that even though we're talking digital, it's truly then how you interact with the patient and how you do that digitally and everything else. So let's not forget our primary purposes as a pharmacist of being able to work with the pharmacist and utilizing those skills that we all seem to, that we all have as we move into the digital world. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in the panel wants to add something? I, I oh, would. Please. Okay. Uh, I, I would just like uh, to add um, that this really a uh, very important question because besides the skills that Whitley and Barry mentioned, especially uh, what, uh, related, uh, what Bitly said related to digital technology skills. What is also important to be aware uh, is that uh, we are heading to a very challenging time because technology is developing so fast that you can't keep up with everything. Uh, and therefore, we have to unite and reunite. And uh, this, this initiative, I think, is very important because definitely one person or one institution cannot uh, do it alone. And we need this strong network of professionals, of educators to be able to support each other and to complement to each other uh, so that we can keep up at least a bit with, with, with the development. So that's just a comment from my side. So anyone else from the panel? Maybe if I can add, Jaime, I think uh, yeah, what please. is also what is also very important is that you also need to have an understanding of the other things that, that are important, like privacy of data, who is responsi uh, responsible when there's a data leak, um, things around um, uh, uh, legal issues, reimbursement, uh, but also ethics. So I think there's also a lot of those types of things that um, uh, are always important in, in the work of a pharmacist, but may have a specific angle uh, when it comes to digital health. And as far as I recall, uh, is that part three of module one, at least partly also talks about some of these things like interoperability and stuff like that. So uh, I think it's covered, but uh, also to keep in mind that that is also part of maybe more the back office type of thing, but uh, equally important to have that uh, meaningful interactions with your patients. Thank you. Really, we cannot see technology as a black box. There is a big responsibility towards patients, also legal responsibility. So we really need to be aware of the things that we're using as with any other medicine. Uh, we're used to that. So I will hand it over now. Thank you for your answers. I will hand it now over to my co-moderator, Dalian, please, if you can proceed. Thank you. Sorry, Harmi was looking for the unmute button. Um, I would like then to move on with a couple more questions that have been shared with us. Um, a question here is, how do we implement a digital health or e-health system in developing countries like Pakistan, as an example? And how do we then ensure that we have infrastructure, technology or software for digital health in countries that are probably not just yet that there yet? Perhaps just general remarks from our colleagues on the call to support our colleagues with this particular query. Who would like to provide an input? Well, 
Narco, thanks a million. Hi, um, thank you for the, you know, the very good question about the, you know, developments of this aspect in resource limited settings. I think it, that is the best reason for us to develop such courses in the FIP. That was the preliminary um, purpose and the focus of this program because that report shows that, you know, these resource limited countries needed the you know experts to integrate in such topics and then learn the topics so that they can teach so these are the something that you know we focus on in this program so i think i highly recommend for those countries to unite and coming into the fip so that now we can support each other but also the you know integrating digital health topics in the healthcare system can't you know, complete you know, just not only educators, so that they, you know, all different parts of the FIP can support this resource limited setting, you know, integrating the digital health, developing digital health, and then also um develop the infrastructure for that in the pharmacy practice. So I think it, I again they you know they would like to emphasize the benefit of the FIP for these countries too. Thank you, Narco. We have Akia as well, and we have Mohammed. Please. Yes. So, what I would like to add is that we've had questions before, like, can FIP maybe develop a curriculum or something like that? But I think this question again emphasizes that each country, each region has its own uh, way that they that they use digital health, that they can integrate it in their practices. And of course, education needs to live up to what is the need of the country. And I think that when you look at the module two, this is also the starting point, like an analysis of your own curriculum, but also an analysis of your own health system. Where is digital health at this point in time? Where do you want to head in maybe the next five to 10 years, if that's an adequate amount of time to kind of prepare your education and then education should ensure that we prepare the future workforce for what is ahead in the upcoming years and so it, it's a, a, a tailored um, um, a question I would say and also probably a tailored answer and yes I also agree with you Naoko that similar countries of course can learn and team up uh, uh, as well. Thanks Akia Mohammed. Uh, yes, uh, thanks so much, uh, Naoko and Okia. Okay, this is exactly what I would like to add, that uh, we should not wait until the technology come to us because technology is, is really invading our life and, uh, and uh, invading the, the technology applications are invading all the aspects of our life. And uh, I believe we need champions, we need early adopters, like people who are sitting with us today, the attendees. Those people can be the future change makers and the future champions. So the, we need to empower them with the resources required and with the educational materials. And we need also to, to empower our colleagues, the academicians, to start right away integrating such topics in their curricula. Uh, our our uh, uh, curricula should should respond quickly to such very rapid changes in the in the market, and uh, uh, this is a way uh, we need to to go in these two parallel directions. Uh, uh, the the implementation of what we can implement and learning and preparing our future graduates for what is coming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for the insights there. Jaime, I think we could probably do one more question um, of your choosing. I think we touched on the tailored approach. We touched on the needs-based uh, uh, also tailoring of, of digital health and how we could start from uh, early stages. Um, before we can move on to our CEO, Catherine Duggan, for her reflections and insights as well. Jaime, I'm just looking. There's a couple more questions there. Do you have a, have you got one there that we haven't touched on just yet? Yeah. Um, uh, there, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, there's one question coming from an anonymous um, attendee. Uh, while we were preparing uh, this course, also in the previous edition, there was kind of uh, sometimes not a mistake, but uh, we kind of mixed uh, using digital health tools for educating students 
uh, with teaching them with uh, the skills and needs uh, to to better know and uh, implement and use uh, digital health. So there was like a misconception and uh, COVID has been terrible for sure, but it has also brought some opportunities, uh, not only professionally for pharmacy as well, new ways to implement new services and shine as we did uh, globally, but also uh, I think that uh, my, my feeling, uh, just my feeling coming from that question, uh, I think that pharmacy schools and pharmacy students are now because of the digital health tools that they've been using uh, for teaching, they are now even more ready for uh, learning about digital health. What what are your uh, what's your answer uh, to to that question? Do you think there's more readiness from pharmacy schools and educating institutions to uh, to teach on digital health because of COVID? Who can answer that question? Well, absolutely. I would say absolutely. Yeah. We've um, we've we've had to teach digitally for a, a year or two, and then uh, our students got very interested in this. And then we had to it's our the practice, especially in the United States, and I know in other um, Western countries, uh, we had to go to that kind of model of digital health, and so it's become a by absolute need of the pandemic we've had to move much faster into this area than we ever thought we would. And the colleges are recognizing that at least all the faculty you see here from around the world are very involved in that. Uh, I would add, uh, yeah. Thanks so much, Barry, for this insights. I would add that uh, we should make a distinction between digital education and digital health. Digital education is what we have done during the uh, pandemic using the software applications to engage our students and to deliver materials and to explain topics and that, that, uh, that stuff. But digital health is something else. Digital health is a big umbrella that includes using virtual reality to treat certain mental illnesses, for example, using digital therapeutics or software applications to uh, detect or screen diseases or to uh, prevent certain diseases or to manage uh, some others. Uh, using telepharmacy as a, a remote tool to uh, empower our patients and to have a kind of remote access, especially for those who are in the rural areas or for uh, during the pandemic and lockdown. I believe these are the tools that we need to focus on while teaching digital health. But uh, using digital tools to improve our teaching capabilities is a little bit of digital education or uh, uh, online learning or something like this. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's time now to, to move to our next uh, steps in, in today's uh, event. So it's my pleasure to hand it over again to Dalia to proceed with, uh, with the next items. I'm joining hands with you, Jaime, to welcome our CEO, Dr. Catherine Duggan, at this point in time, to really just um, welcome her to this presentation. Thank you so much, Catherine, for joining us. And we're all very also curious and to, to learn that you're We'll provide some of your feedback and some insights as to what you've listened to so far and learned about the project. Thanks a million. Thanks, Dahlia and Jaime. Thanks to Genuine as well for his continued hard work in this area and to all of our panellists and to everyone who has stayed uh, for the whole of this event. A really great attendance. And I think that shows us at FIP this whole area, um, whether it's digital education or digital health, as Barry has well delineated for us, this is a really big area for FIP, for us as individuals and for us in our countries. And I've taken a couple of um, points from the whole presentation and from the panel discussion that I just want to reflect back to um, perhaps us internally, uh, but also perhaps to our attendees as well. I really note, um, as Barry mentioned, what is the difference between education using digital enablers versus health? And also to remember that um, anything digital should enhance and not replace. That if we think about digital health as being an add-on, we may well um, meet the needs of patients and populations. But if we seek to replace the added value of the pharmacist and the interactions, then I think that we will result in a lot more inequities. And I think about our ageing um, patient populations or those that may not have access to digital for any reason. So that's something that's very hot on my mind 
in terms of um, our ethical standpoint. So take home message number one, digital to enhance, not to replace. And I think we've learned a lot from that. I mean, look, look at FIP. Uh, we have digital events now. We're not seeking to replace the face to face experience, but to enhance. And additionally, by having a digital provision, you can reach uh, parts of the profession that perhaps couldn't come to a face to face event. Uh, so I think it's all about learning from all areas of our life. I think there's um, a really interesting longer term issue around the regulations of this. And I think that plays very nicely into the concept of developing a curriculum or developing tools for individual nations to develop curriculum and the place of regulations in that or standardization or harmonization. To have a big debate on that, I think will be very, very helpful so that we don't leave anyone behind in this conversation and these developments, but also that countries have the ability to adopt and adapt, which is the FIP motto after all, um, and that we all learn from each other. I think there's really, really good points being made uh, throughout the entire session um, about the issues to do with having a one size fits all won't be appropriate. Um, I think that's something that we know from all of our programmes of work, actually. But in terms of digital, I think that's even more important. Um, so I look at my colleagues here. Some of us are more digitally or technologically enabled than others. And again, that brings into play the um, the equity and the equality of what we will be providing. May I just say as well that where um, countries had to turn to digital delivery of education and digital events and digital programs during the pandemic and have learned good practices as a result, there's much to be learned from all of our regions and all of our countries in the globe. And I think a lessons learned or a sharing best practice um, is a really good uh, thing to continue. It's been done, but I don't think we should stop. I think each year now, uh, we're gonna see more and more advances advances in technology, but then also all of the issues about how do we keep up to date? How do we embrace it? How do we take it forward? How do we remove the risks? Um, and how do we enhance what we're doing through digital applications rather than uh, replace it? So I think for me, there's something there about FIP to continue in this role. Um, I think that this is a, an area, uh, Jaime, we have this in the technology advisory group. I mean, it's one of the biggest areas in our profession, whether it's an opportunity or a risk, whether it's a weakness or a strength. So this is going to be one of those areas, but I don't think it only sits in the technology advisory group. I think we want to engage and involve more colleagues from regulations, colleagues from academia, colleagues from practice, and seek to be on the front foot of digital and technological advancement. I've been really excited by this, and I think it's one of the great um, events where we have got colleagues from around the world, but also colleagues from around FIP, learning together, sharing together, inspiring together. And I really commend you all on the work. And I think it's a model for other parts of FIP to learn from as well. So there's going to be much to do colleagues on this agenda, and we must not stand still with this. For me, I feel half excited about digital and technological advances and half terrified. And I think that is um, the same for many. And finally, I would say that many of our um, early career professionals, um, they are on the front wave of technological advances, so they can lead and help and support us as well. So I look forward to including everyone. I think this is a truly one fit programme of work. And um, I must say a big, big thank you to everyone involved. Uh, learning and adapting modules and courses is the way forward in this area. Thank you all so much. Um, it's been great to listen and to summarise with some remarks, which I don't think is telling you anything new. I think you said it all already, but it's been very, very um, fabulous to be involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, that wonderful summary, as you've mentioned already. And we're so grateful that we've been able to launch the updated course. Super exciting news, colleagues. Congratulations on this wonderful milestone. Already in the chat and the Q&A, you'll see there are already some ideas coming through that might be for the next update. Who knows? Things looking at reimbursement, looking at the involvement of pharmaceutical scientists more. So there's always room for improvement. I thank you all for being with us today. And thanks, Catherine, for you know giving us the final remarks. 
what I would like to do is um, just share with our listeners a couple of announcements to conclude this presentation. Um, Jaime, I also want to thank you for co-moderating with me today. Um, it's been fabulous having you on the call. Thank you, Genuine, for all the support in the background. Thank you, colleagues. We would like to take this opportunity, Jaime and I, to make you consider coming to Brisbane, Australia for the 81st FIP World Congress of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. Exciting, coming up in September. Um, Jaime, any remarks on the Congress? You're excited? Uh, there's a technology <laughs> summit, of course. Uh, Amazing. Saturday, which uh, we will cover, of course, something related to education, which is super important. So you are more than invited to consider coming to Brisbane. We're waiting for you. Amazing, amazing. And the early bird registration deadline is on the 15th of June, if you are considering um, coming down under. Next slide, please, Genuine. I would like to also take this opportunity to introduce our colleagues to the Pharmacy Education Journal, that PEJ, if you're not aware of it, this is FIP's fully open access and peer-reviewed journal that has been serving the domain of pharmacy education, workforce development, and associated fields for over 20 years. The PEJ specifically supports and encourages early career academics, scientists, and practitioners, one FIP approach, to publish work with a no cost route to, to dissemination. So you're welcome to also find out more about this through our website. And finally, I'd like to remind you all that if you are to, would like to watch this recording again, or um, watch any of our previous recordings or upcoming events, please do visit our website on events.fip.org. Thank you, Emilian. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you and Good afternoon, good evening, and goodbye to you all. Thank you, speakers. Thanks, guests. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. Uh, registrations are open.